a great pleasure right now to have uh, joining us today one of the co-authors of a very interesting book. It's called Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle Class. We're joined by a professor of political science at the University of California at Berkeley, Paul Pearson, today. And uh, Paul, thanks for joining us. How are you? Thanks for having me on, Doug. Good. Good. Good to have a chance to talk to you. I had a chance to, to read through the book uh, over the weekend there. And uh, I tell you, when you when you tackle a, uh, a topic like this, I mean, it, it, it's such a fluid topic. I know you go back in history somewhat, but uh, it changes day to day. That must have been a bit of a challenge for you to, to, to write this that way, right? Well, we wanted to try to take a broad view on it to give people a sense not just of what's going on today, but how that fits into a into a longer story. So we hope having that, that perspective is helpful. I mean, we actually the book uh, actually came out 18 months ago, but uh, you know, it's on the, the bestseller list now, I think, because uh, people are talking about this issue of economic inequality more than ever. Uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, and the presidential campaign have, have really brought these concerns that, that we that were focusing on in our book to, to everyone's attention. Yeah, this is the uh, the paperback version, which uh, is just coming out, I guess, uh, in the next couple of weeks. But right. when you when you look at that uh, that topic of economic uh, inequality, I guess it's not. This isn't the first time that's been a political issue. I think you talk about it in a book back in uh, the days of FDR. That was also a, a topic as well, wasn't it? We have definitely been here before. Uh, I mean, both both the, the period around the Depression and the New Deal, and uh, the end of the 19th, early 20th century. That now that People talk about it as the progressive era. You know, a lot of the conversations sound the same. A lot of people feeling like uh, the government had been uh, captured, hijacked uh, by uh, powerful economic interests, and that it was hard for ordinary citizens to have their voices heard. Well, when you go back in, in history, well, what, what kind of your process? Uh, did you just look at old uh, newspaper articles? Or how did you kind of come, you know, go back then and then and, and bring it up to date to what we're going through now? Well, the story that, that we really want to focus on is uh, what's happened since the 1970s. And the, mm -hmm. there, there are a couple of reasons why we, we start there. Um, the, uh, the one reason is because that was sort of the end of a period in which uh, we really had a middle class, what we would call a middle class economy, one where the, the JFK line that a, a rising tide lifts all boats really applied to the United States. And, you know, there was, there was income inequality, but but pretty much everybody's income was going up as, as he produced economic growth. And then we started shifting over to, towards this new economic period in which the gains of economic growth have really, really been concentrated with the top 1% or even more concentrated than that, the top 10th of 1%. Uh, it's really a stunning change in uh, what happens to um, – uh, to economic growth and how it's distributed. And the other reason why we focused on the 70s is, is because that's when American politics, we argue, really starts to change. Uh, business becomes much more mobilized. Uh, money becomes much more important in American politics. Uh, lobbying efforts expand dramatically. Uh, and uh, the political class responds to that, both Democrats and Republicans. I thought it was interesting you, you talk about where a lot of people think, well, when uh, Ronald Reagan got elected. That was kind of the, the start of a whole different movement of more conservatism with uh, economics and all that. But you talk about the, during the Carter presidency uh, was really kind of a, an anchor point of uh, big change. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, we, we talk about this as a, you know, the forgotten 1970s. People think of that as kind of a, a you know, the 1960s were were lively in American politics with uh, Nixon in Vietnam, and uh, the 80s are lively with Ronald Reagan, and the 70s are kind of forgotten, but we think that was really the, the crucial period when uh, American society, with respect to how the economy operates and its connection to Washington, D.C., this is when the critical changes take place. So, yes, you, you get the first round of huge tax cuts aimed at uh, the very top of the income distribution. You get those in the last couple of years of the Carter administration, uh, even before Reagan comes into office. And we argue that a big part of that story is because there was this massive uh, mobilizing effort by, uh, by business in the 1970s. You know, before that, uh, you talk about uh, where I think a lot of people don't realize, or, or maybe they forgot, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, uh, people, I guess, think of him maybe as conservative, at least fiscally, but uh, he made a lot of changes that were, I guess you could look at almost liberal nowadays, couldn't you, back when he was first president, right? Oh, he, he, he you know, would be unrecognizable in today's Republican Party. I mean, on, on economic, uh, on, on domestic policy issues having to do with the economy and 
uh, government social insurance programs and so on, he, you know, he would look like a, a, a middle of the road Democrat for sure. Um, you know, was was pushing proposals for um, a national a version of national health insurance. Uh, you know, certainly more more liberal than uh, than the bill that Barack Obama pushed for. Uh, and uh, more more money for social security. Actually, government spending goes up. Uh, more quickly under under Nixon than it does under under LBJ. Uh, so very very different. And actually, you know, if we were working on that book now, you could draw the com uh, the contrast between uh, Mitt Romney and his father George Romney, mm-hmm. uh, who again, you know, George Romney, uh, the, the father who was a very successful businessman and then uh, moved into politics and became governor of Michigan and a presidential candidate. Uh, and his position on these issues. Uh, also would look much more like a Democrat today than like a, a, anybody in the Republican Party. Yeah, interesting uh, to kind of look back at history that way. You also talk in the book about uh, deregulation. Of course, under Reagan, a lot of things were deregulated, and uh, financial deregulation was a, a, a big uh, topic. Of course, Phil Graham, I know you, you spent quite a bit in the book uh, on him, a former senator who, I guess you almost, uh, I don't know if you want to put the blame on him, but he, he was responsible for a lot of, uh, of I guess, the financial disparity, right? Uh, from some of his actions? Well, this is one of the huge changes that takes place in, uh, over this period and that is connected with the way that uh, income inequality has grown is uh, that uh, the financial markets are deregulated and Wall Street explodes in size uh, as a result of that and also starts to engage in in all kinds of activities which are very lucrative uh, for those engaged in them when they work but potentially really disrupted to the broader economy, as, as we've learned over, over the last few years. Uh, and a lot of this uh, did happen uh, in Washington. You know, there were growing connections between between Wall Street and Washington. And, and we, we focus on a couple of figures uh, as an illustration of that. We're not saying that it was all Phil Graham, but he was certainly uh, one of the leading forces in pushing aggressively uh, for financial deregulation, uh, you know, and there, there are cases. Another figure that we that we focus on the Democratic Party is Chuck Schumer, the senator from New York, right. uh, who's a liberal on most issues, uh, but not when it comes to things uh, that affected um, the ability of of Wall Street to increase its role in the economy. Yeah, interesting. Uh, he's uh, apparently uh, from from your research there a very good fundraiser. <laughs> it's an extremely good fundraiser. Uh, uh, the best that the Democrats had uh, during this period. Yeah, uh, you wouldn't think of that necessarily. I, I grew up in New York, but I, from a distance now in Florida, I kind of keep up with with him a bit. But I didn't realize that that was really his one of his strengths was was raising funds. It's interesting to look well, at. Well, you know, it's a really it's a good example of of what's happened in Washington, where uh, you know he he was able to get a position on uh, banking committees both in the House and then later when he moved to the Senate, and which is understandable if you're a representative from. New York, a representative from Manhattan. Uh, the financial interests are very, very important there. Uh, but that's an incredible perch uh, from which uh, to raise money from those who are, are concerned about whether government's going to let them do uh, the things that they want to do that are very profitable for them. And, you know, we argue that that produced huge distortions in the American economy. I mean, by the, by the latter part of the last decade, uh, almost a third of all corporate profits in the U.S. were being earned in the banking industry. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that just can't be healthy for the economy. I know we have limited time today, but uh, uh, Paul, are, are you sort of optimistic that uh, this is going to shake out and, and work out, or uh, how do you see it? I know this is a big election year, a lot of things can change rapidly, but uh, what are your thoughts right now? Well, I think it's a long slog. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, we argue when we look at these earlier historical periods, it is really difficult for for voters, for ordinary citizens, to reach their control over their government. It's not something that happens overnight. Uh, it's something that requires a lot of organization and sustained effort. I don't think a single election, however it comes out, uh, is, going to, is going to turn that around. Uh, but I am, you know, the things that make me optimistic are, are first of all, that people are starting to realize uh, that this kind of inequality is not inevitable. It's not just a result of globalization or some impersonal economic forces. So we can potentially control it. And people are paying a lot more attention to these issues than they were uh, even a few years ago. So I think that's the basis for some optimism. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating book called Winner Take All Politics. We've been joined by uh, Paul Pearson today. We also wrote along with Jacob 
as Hacker. And uh, Paul, get out a website, can we get a hold of a book, or maybe send you a message if they like? Uh, well, you can get it on Amazon, and uh, Bill Moyers did a, a very nice interview about, about the book and our arguments a couple of weeks ago, and there's a lot of information about the book along with that interview on his website, which is BillMoyers.com. Great. Paul, appreciate you taking a few minutes today, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again sometime. Thanks for joining us. Doug, thanks for having me on.